Welcome to our Read series. This series is designed to encourage you to R. Read the Bible, E. Every day, A. Ask questions, and D. Determine to obey. As pastor of Oregon Trail Baptist Church, it's my goal that this time of reflection on the Bible reading from the previous week will serve as an encouragement to you to read the Bible, but will also open up opportunities to share, discuss, and ask questions about what you've discovered in God's Word, that we may grow together. As we renew our minds by the washing of the Word, we desire to draw closer to God and to each other. We'll start with a word of prayer, that way I don't forget to do that if we go along here, and then we'll dive in here. Lord, we thank you for your word, and uh, Lord, as we uh, share what we have learned from it this week and and dive into some of those truths, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to truth, and would your word uh, change us in your son's name. Amen. Whoops. (laughs) I, I I have some good news for you, Dennis. Cody Howe, who cleans the carpet, says it's not coffee that stains, it's creamer. So, yeah, Dennis does not have creamer in his coffee, so. All right, so I want to start this week by actually touching back to a question from last week, to which I'm telling you right up front, I don't have a clear-cut answer, but I have a few more things to chew on that... I don't know why it does that. So we had a question last night about, last night, last week. Wow. This week has gone really fast. Um, Genesis 35, 4. And if you want to turn there, that might not be a bad thing. Uh, also, while you're turning there, uh, while I was putting this together to post the audio online, I'm like, I have to name this series something. So I called it the Read series. Um, read the Bible. See if I got the acronym. Uh, let's see. Read the Bible. I, I lost it all. Explain. I don't know. This is pretty bad when I I name a whole new series and I don't know what I call it. Um, yes. Uh, let's see here. I'll have to pull up the picture I made to go with it. Read scripture every day. Ask questions and determine to obey. So that's what I'm calling this series. And uh, we'll just kind of work in and out as we read the Bible together um, through the bulletin reading program. Uh, That's the idea behind it. All right, so Genesis 35. The question we were dealing with, uh, I should get to it myself. All right, 35, verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeareth unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise, and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all their strange gods, which were in uh, in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon these cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. And the question we kind of ended with last week was, why did he bury these idols, or bury these gods. And I, and I probably need to stop right there. Um, what is a Kleenex? It's a, okay, it's a tissue, right? But we say Kleenex, and Kleenex is specifically one brand of tissue, right? Same thing is true if I say, um, well, this could have a couple different ways. A Coke, yeah, or a Bobcat. Um, you might be thinking the animal, but if you're thinking construction equipment, and I say a bobcat, um, it's generally a skid steer, even though the company Bobcat makes other things that are not skid steer, right? So what happens is there's an overlap in terms, 
and that's fairly normal. So here, I think there's an overlap of terms happening, and that's the, the, the term for gods and the term of idols kind of overlapping here a little bit. And, and it makes sense because they're worshiping these figurines to worship a god type thing. So um, that's why I can. Inst I feel like it's justified to jump. This isn't them hiding. I don't know. What, what else would it be other than an idol they're putting down there? I mean, these are what they're considering to be gods or deities. This is how they communicate with them. Um, so a couple things to note, and I, I did some digging, and a couple things just context-wise. In chapter 33, Jacob meets up with Esau. There's this reconciliation, but it kind of ends with, we can tell Jacob's still not trusting God completely. Chapter 34 we have the very uncomfortable story of Dinah and the Shechemites, or you could say uh, Levi and Simeon and the Shechemites, where basically she is um, she's raped, and then the Shechemites are Levi and Simeon convince them to all get circumcised, and in doing so, once they're sore, they go kill everybody in the city, and this is a bad thing. But in that story, they plunder the city of Shechem. Okay, now this story is beginning, that, that just happened in chapter 34, pl they plundered the city of Shechem. Now what else did they bury with these idols? The earrings. Now, why would they bury the earrings? Any thoughts? Okay, that is one thought. Okay, and that kind of leads into another thing of, um, in a lot of pagan... Okay, it could be part of the plunder. And, and so there's a little discussion here. Is what they buried the plunder from Shechem? Is what they buried Laban's gods? Remember the ones that Rachel stole? Or is what they buried kind of both? I'm in the camp of I think it's kind of both. Does, does that make, make sense? Um, also here uh, with this, the earrings, again, it could be tied to they were like fetishes. So, so think about like people would wearing amulets or other things to ward off type evil spirit type mentality. Charms, yeah, fetishes or charms. Um, the earrings could have been tied to that in that way. Um, some people point to that the earrings could have been used to make an idol. I don't think that's the strongest point, but... Have we seen that in scripture elsewhere? Where? Golden calf and one other story. One other story we actually covered, well, we covered in November. <laughs> That's in the story of Gideon. They give him the, the, the earrings and whatever, from the, and he makes a golden ephod that then becomes an idol and they worship. And wh however that worked, whether it was a, just a chest plate on top of an idol or whether he made the whole idol whatever is happening there. So there might be some merit, or maybe the author's trying to get us to think with an eye to those stories, like, oh, this is the earrings. Um, I, I don't know, because it just doesn't seem like... I think it seems like a leap to me to go, okay, since this item is maybe gold or silver and valuable, I can't have it because I might make an idol with it. D does that make... It seems like a pretty big leap to me. Um, But they did just raid an entire city. So, so you know what I'm saying. This is the this is the type of thing where I am very comfortable going. We can look at the text, and we're picking up these different patterns, and we're looking at it, and we're talking about it, and we're considering it. And the end of the day, we're, we may not be a hundred percent sure, but I can tell you what: we can still learn from it. D does that make sense? Yeah, so um, I think I think Barry's probably the idea um, behind the hid. Um, that's true. So let me. Well, let me. All right. So what verse is that, Donna? Verse four. Yeah. 
and hid. Okay. Yep. So I just want the word. I am. Well, I'm not going to go to. Come on, I just want that one word. This keyboard does not like me. There we go. And I want. Oh, I got the word gods instead of uh, hid. Sure. Oh, it's not letting me click. So just off the gloss or the quick term, I'm looking here, see where the little wheel is? That's the, um, okay, not, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to not nerd out here a little. That's called the lemma, all right? What a lemma is, is if you're going to look up the word running in the dictionary, what word do you look up? Run. Run is the lemma form of running, okay? The, the, root, the root word that, you know, once you add things to it, it changes its meaning a little. Um, and without getting into a deep, oh, I guess I'm there, word study here. Well, I guess I got it pulled up, or it's pulling up. Okay, here's how that word, it means to hide or to fix secretly. So the wheel here uh, is showing you, if you can see that, um, it's usually translated as hid, but it can be hide, hiding, hideth, laid, hidden, secret, privily laid, laid privily, or privy, which is one of those words we don't use much. So whatever they're doing, they're making it secret. So, yeah. So, good question, though, and that's where um, it's easy especially when I'm not using this computer, <laughs> to, to take a look at those words and what they mean and, and to move forward from there. Um, the other thing to note is there's a different word here used for these gods than the words used in about Laban and the gods that Rachel stole. It's a different term, um, and I'm not sure if that's significant or not. Uh, there's one scholar. I don't have his commentary, but I do have an expert not expert, an excerpt from it where they're d describing it. And he, he takes the assumption that these are the household gods that Rachel stole. Um, and he has an interesting take here. He says, um, the text continued mockery of these gods, which can be stolen, sat on, um, and now buried. And I skipped one just for the sake of children being here. Um, and then he goes on to consider how in contrast to these gods, which really can be manipulated and thrown under a tree, they can be thrown under, you know, the stuff on a camel, they can be stolen and lied about. In contrast to that, Jacob is now obeying the God of the Bible and going to serve him. Do you see how this doesn't match? <laughs> you can't worship these false gods, who all these things can happen by humans to, and then worship the true God. It doesn't correlate. And I think that's an interesting point uh, to make. Um, also, this whole chapter fulfills a vow Jacob made. Back in Genesis 28, uh, he vowed that if God would bring him back from exile, uh, that he would worship him alone. Here, God is bringing him back from exile. He's now met his brother Esau, which the irony is, uh, there's a couple different thoughts, whether this was like 10 years or 30 years or whatever it works. He hasn't got rid of these household gods. When Rachel was hiding them on the blanket, under the blanket or whatever, in the camel stuff, um, he may not have known about it, which he probably didn't know about it because he was convinced he hadn't taken the household gods. But at some point along the way, he knows about it. And they're still floating around in his household. And I think that's a, a dangerous uh, thing. Uh, Kyle and Delich, which are older commentators, um, they noted that um, God gave him the command uh, to put away foreign gods, uh, and 
thus Laban's household gods and maybe these other idols that came from Shechem and the earrings uh, that may have been worn as amulets are something he is now getting rid of. The question of was this destroying them? There's a really interesting phrase in the Septuagint. Now, I'm, I'm, I feel like a professor, so please, I'm trying to make this simple and fun and enjoyable. Does anybody remember what the Septuagint is? Yes, okay. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So you have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, written in Hebrew. Then you have the Greek translation. Now, today there is much debate on translations of the Bible and how it should be done and who should do it and how the emphasis should be. and Should it be uh, word for word or thought for thought? And there's, there's discussion, there's debate, and there's gunfire back and forth on this. Okay? However, whoever did the Old Testament translation from Hebrew to Greek, we really don't know how that happened or who it happened under. There's a legend that it was 70 Jewish men who got together, they all translated the Old Testament into Greek, and they all ended up magically with the exact same translation. Therefore, it's you know God's work. And, but the problem with that is the Septuagint is actually just a family of manuscripts that are Greek, and they're not all the same. All that to say, in there's some Septuagint manuscripts that read here. Uh, they add on to this phrase in, in about what happens with, with these idols. They add on, and he destroyed them unto this day. So the, the Septuagint translator, and this happens before Jesus even walks the earth. They're looking at this passage, and they're adding the phrase, okay, this is destroyed. Now, a little bit of interpretation added in, but it's interesting for us to go back and see, okay, this is something they were thinking about before Jesus walked the earth. Do you have a thought there? Yeah. 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 Um, so I have a printed copy of these notes uh, that I'm kind of using to keep myself on track here. Um, yeah, and that's right there. I don't know if you can see the LXX added. That's that's what, in academic, if you want to shorten the word, you just put LXX. It means the 70, and that's where we call Septuagint. So, yes, dear? Okay, that's fine. My train derails all the time. There's one other key word which is really interesting in this, and I'm, I'm not sure how far to take it or what to do with it. And that's the word oak. What does it say? A terebinth tree. Okay, so the, a terebinth tree. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, T-E-R-E-B-I-N. Th. Now, that is not a term I reckon any of you use this week in any form. Um, and a terebinth tree is not a type of tree. It's not necessarily an oak. It's not necessarily a spruce. It's not necessarily... A terebinth tree is a tree that's, that's connected with... It's kind of like a worship site. Okay? Now, what do we know in the Old Testament about worship sites, and trees. Yes! Yeah, Astaroth. Yes. And, and there seems to be, in the Old Testament thinking, and not all of this was Jewish thinking, some of this Canaanite, but one of the places you would encounter a divine being. And I say that because Abraham has encountered God at the Oak of Mamre. Abraham, I think, also encountered God here at Shechem at a tree. Um, I could be wrong there. But Canaanites would set up groves or the Asheroth pole, a tree. It was a, it was a place to commune with a god or a deity. Now, for Israel, what god is that that they might be speaking to or meeting with? Okay, the god of the, the Bible, Okay, the, the god who made all things. For a Canaanite, that could be Ashtoreth. It could be other, yeah, other things. So it becomes a site of worship, a site 
So, so this brings a couple things. If he's hiding these items at the site, some think in some ways he's actually commemorating this stuff to the Lord and just leaving it there as kind of a, a sacrifice and getting rid of it, or an offering, not sacrifice. Others think, no, no, no. It, Jacob knows that this is a worship site for the people of Shechem, and by putting all this stuff here under the tree, he's desecrating their site. So, I don't know. I really don't know either way on that. Um, but Yeah, they could totally do that. So, Yeah, and it becomes a translation issue because when I was covering the story of Abraham, I, I was reading about Abraham in the plains of Mamre, in the plains of Mamre, and I'm like, why do other translations have by the oak of Mamre? And I look up the word, and the way the word is, is used, it can mean either plain or it can mean oak, and it kind of makes more sense that it was a, a tree of sorts because you can identify a tree and where that's at. A plain is a very large area to try to identify, uh, which, I mean, sure, you can identify this is my field, this is my territory, but to know a specific spot within that is a little bit unique. So translators, I never want to stand in the pulpit and make people doubt their translation of the Bible, okay? Because there are good men who know way more about the Hebrew and the Greek that ha are working on, on the Bible translation, and their goal is to put God's word accessible to people who don't know those languages. And I commend that. Um, so I, d I never want to throw any translation under the bus. I will say some translations, because they're older, at times they didn't have some of the manuscripts and things at their disposal to go, oh, this is what this word means or can mean. Um, and so sometimes different theories have popped up uh, or translations that uh, they're not bad, it's just when we look at a couple other things, we go, oh, there might be another nuance to this. So, Any other thoughts or questions? That is all from last week's reading, <laughs> or two weeks ago. Yes, dear. Mm, I, I would, okay, so, so the statement she made was, the Septuagint translators would have more contact context to make that. They understand that. <sighs> yes. Okay. So, th and that's the thought process, and that's good. That's good thinking. Is that they're closer to the culture, they're closer to the time, they're closer to the languages. They should understand it more. Why do you think I'd be kind of going about that? <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the Septuagint, okay, for instance, and, and this is, this is an academic debate. You go into the genealogies and almost every person in the genealogy has a hundred years added on to their, added or taken away. There's a hundred year discrepancy on almost every individual in like the genealogy lists between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. It's a big difference. It's, it's really big. Um, there's also times with the Septuagint where there's points where we, those who are nerds and scholars, tell that whoever's translating, they're kind of interpreting while they translate. They're not just doing a translation from the Hebrew to the, the Greek. Uh, and like here, where they say, and he destroyed them until this day, they're kind of adding on to that, you know. Um, However, I'm not in the camp that says we should take the Septuagint, since it's not the original Hebrew, and chuck it. Well, that's the interesting thing, is in the New Testament, and I should... You're getting me off topic on anything I wanted to talk about today. Um, okay, so I, I just need to put this out here. So we have the Hebrew, and I'm just going to put HB for Hebrew, okay? This is what the Old Testament originally was written in. That gets translated into the Septuagint. And there's the Roman numeral for LXX for 70. That's the Septuagint. That is the Greek translation. Now here's the question. In the New Testament, when Jesus, Paul, 
Luke, and others, when they quote their Bible, which one do they normally quote? Do they quote the Hebrew or the Septuagint? And, and I need to stop here and preface this. What we're looking at here is not the times when these two are the exact same. If they both read the same way, then there is no discrepancy. It's like, well, you can't tell if he was quoting Hebrew or Septuagint because they're both reading the exact same. Okay? What we're talking about is, for instance, in, in Acts 15, at the Jerusalem Council, James quotes Amos. And when he quotes Amos, Amos has a few lines in the Septuagint that are not there in the Hebrew. And James follows the Septuagint. Interesting thought, right? Okay, James follows the Septuagint. How about Paul in Galatians 2? In the Galatians 2 passage, Paul says that Abraham, or the law was given at the hand of, anybody know? No, nope, not Moses. Angels. Now, when was the law given? It was given to Moses. He was, where was he at? On Mount Sinai, right? The law is given on Mount Sinai. Now, if you watch the Charlton Heston movie, who's on Mount Sinai? <laughs> All right? You got Moses and you got God, right? But Paul makes the note to say, like, by the hands of angels. Well, this is where it's interesting because in the Hebrew text, you have Moses. You have God. You don't have angels. But there's a line added in the Septuagint that has Moses. It mentions God. And the Septuagint reads, a myriad of angels. Now, that's why I think we should just stop and consider the Septuagint at times when we're interpreting the Bible. Because if Paul could use it, and Luke could use it, and others used it, I think it's worth thinking about. And this is where textual criticism becomes very complicated, and this is not an issue for Sunday school class, nor is it an issue that I like to deal with. <laughs> but it's one of those issues where I'm, I'm aware of it, because <sighs> I had a discussion years ago with a person who was... Um, I could really get myself in trouble for this, I suppose, but whatever. They're a King James only person. Now, here at our church, we use the King James. I think it's a good translation. I, I like the King James. Um, but I am very comfortable if, if you, in your own personal life, you're choosing to do something else, that's fine. But this person had been just stuck in the argument of King James only, and I brought up the argument. I said, so... If our King James Bible, I'm really getting off here. If our King James Bible's Old Testament is only from the Hebrew, and specifically the Masoretic text, okay? If it's only from that, but Jesus used the Septuagint, who's right? Now, now I'm not... I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus. My whole point in this discussion is that we should look at what God has preserved for us and allowed us to see and have. And yes, we can still use the translation of the King James, and I, I think it's a great translation, and I'm going to continue to use it. But I can't be on that bandwagon that says, this is the only thing God has preserved for English-speaking people. Because if, if James and Paul and Luke and Jesus can quote from the Septuagint, I think it's worth me taking my time to look at it um, as well. Any thoughts, sir? Uh-huh. The 1611? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so it was actually it was actually him that I shared this with, <laughs> um, and he his response uh, not to 
His, I've never heard that. And I'm, no, I'm not faulting your son. But those who are touting the King James only position and saying this is the only Bible for English-speaking people, they're not honest with stuff like this. Um, Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer, and I can't remember who worked with him, they compiled an entire list and made it into a book of the times the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, looking at whether it quoted the Hebrew or the Septuagint, or we couldn't tell. And it's one of those things where when, when you have people digging on that level, these are men who are conservative. These are men who believe their Bible. They're, they, they love the Lord. And they're coming, looking at this going, we just need to consider what's on the table there. We need to look at this. God has preserved this for it. Who are we to say we can't look at these things? And, and I understand in, in textual criticism, there's different approaches to how to value one text or one document over another. I get that. But to say, well, this subset is all we're ever going to look at. we got problems. Um, getting a smile back there. Do you have some, want to add something? Okay. This is an issue. <laughs> Go for it. Yes. Right. As you can tell, I don't. I'm looking for a book and I can't find it, and I know it's in here somewhere. Anyway, you can get, they have in published print, Septuagints that have been translated from the Greek Septuagint into English. Now, why would we do that? Why would we care about something that goes from Hebrew to Greek to English? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody, no, no, I don't think that's the purpose of these translations. What they're doing is they're trying to put in the hands of, of people who don't read Greek so they can actually read an English translation of how the Septuagint reads a little different or sounds a little different than even the Hebrew Bible. Does that make sense? Uh, and I think it's kind of an interesting read at points. So. Right. Yes. And yeah, he did. Yes. Yeah. I, and I'm. Now, before we close out here, I want to say a few things to wrap this up. This is an issue that is very divisive in some circles. It's an issue that here at this church, I've not made it an issue because I don't think it is a big issue. Does, does that make sense? If, if someone wants to come in and they really believe the only Bible that they should ever read is a King James, that's fine, but don't propagate that at this church, okay? <laughs> don't. And, and I understand the former pastor here was of that persuasion, but I've had several conversations with several of the members here, and I remember one that stuck, sticks out in my mind where they said, well, my grandkids are reading this version of the Bible. And, and, and they won't read a King James. And I'm like, I'm glad they're reading the Bible. I, I mean, does that make, does that make sense? And the other thing is, when you compare English translations, when you look at the differences in how they read, okay, if you come through the lens like everything translated in the King James is absolutely perfect, therefore everything else is wrong, you're going to critique all the other translations. However, when you come at the aspect and go, huh, all these translations got this a little different here, or they, they've really split out, or hey, everybody here is about saying the same thing. Where they split out, if you, if you find those are the, sometimes when I'm studying a passage, I will look up 
how the translations are similar or different. Where they're different, that's where I spend more time digging in the Greek and Hebrew. D does that make sense? Because it's like, where they're different, they're, they're picking up different s aspects of something, and nobody sits down to do a translation and checks their mind in at the door. Okay, I, That's why certain translations lean towards certain theologies. You can't say that, oh, they're promoting this theology. They're not even trying to at some points. But there are certain groups and translations that they kind of lean one way or the other. Well, kind of got off here. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 I, I want to summarize what you said. We have God's word. We can be confident we have God's word. Um, if I was really quick, I'd pull it up for you. New, the new, just the New Testament. We have like over 2,000 some manuscripts of the New Testament. When you come to Iliad and the Odyssey and some of the great classic Greek writings, we have 30, 100, 200 copies. Which one do you think has been preserved better? <laughs> you know, and, and, and we don't have to be afraid of some of the nuanced little differences. Sometimes it was a scribal mistake when somebody copied something. But God's word is perfect. They may not have copied it perfect. We would have this strange phenomenon that every time you wrote a Bible verse down, it would be perfect if God always did that, right? In fact, uh, I was teaching through this years ago, doing an Old Testament survey class, and I took a portion of a apocryphal book, so I think it was like Second Maccabees or something, and I handed a bunch of men, uh, I think it was about 15 men, I handed them each a copy of a page, and I said, I want you, I want you all to start copying this document. And we spent like 20 minutes, and they all copied the page, did their best, and then they gave it to me. And they're like, okay, now what? I'm like, I'll, I'm coming back next week. And the next week, I came back with one sheet of paper that looked like a Greek, um, not a, an apparatus, because there was footnotes everywhere. And so what I did is I took all their documents, and I, I put this is, you know, document one, this is document two, document three, document four. And I went through and noted all the places it was different. <laughs> This guy missed a whole verse. This guy missed a word. This guy misspelled a word. This guy changed a word. And and what happened was they're like, oh. I said, now I asked them, do you think between looking at all these documents, do you think we can figure out pretty close to what the original said? And they're like, yeah, it's pretty obvious. That's what textual criticism is working with and doing. And um, so anyway, we we can have faith. God has given us his word. Yes, there are those who want to be argumentative. That's not my point. I just care about growing and learning uh, through God's word. So, and that's yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> that's, that's what it all comes down to. Whoever hits the road. Yeah. If you don't get that message, I don't care what you're preaching. I think there's also a danger of a desire to con constantly have something new. A.W. Tozer talked about this with Bible translations. He's like, sometimes as a substitute for knowing God, we just think we need a new translation of his word. Yeah. Go 
Yeah. Right. God's seated on the throne, and that's such a fascinating one because it starts off with Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. I think three times or four times Pharaoh hardens his heart, and then it shifts. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's an element in these stories when, and, and that's the type of thing where what I want to do with this series of, of where we're, we're reading the Bible together in the bulletin, we're talking about things, is to pick up some of these nuanced things and talk about them because it helps us see things. When we, even as believers, harden our heart time and time and time again against God, there comes a point where God hardens against us. You know, and, and with Pharaoh, obviously, he's not a believer. He's not a follower of the Lord. He has hardened his heart. But now God begins to harden his heart. So much so, besides the Israelites, who withstood Pharaoh and said, you've gone too far? His own advisors. They're like, knock it off. We're going too far here. God will take someone who will not follow him, who will not go with his plan and purpose. God will take that person. He lets them go down their path until ultimately then he, he, lets, he helps them continue down that path, as it were, with Pharaoh hardening his heart until their own choices destroy them. What happened to Egypt as a result of Pharaoh? The whole nation tanked. Yeah, their economy was tanked. Their military suffered major losses. In fact, it was, it was soon after this, it was the, the utter defeat of Egypt that forced Egypt to pull out of Canaan. Uh, before this point, Egypt had the land of Israel or Canaan. Egypt had a lot of stronghold there and control there. But after this whole thing with Israel leaving, this is where we get into what we read last week, with Israel leaving, Egypt being decimated, Egypt has to focus in on home base now. They got to focus in on right around where they are. And in doing so, it really opened up the next extended period of time for God, for God's people to be able to come in and take the promised land. And that's something we kind of miss in the, in the biblical stories. Like Egypt had a stronghold in Canaan until the Exodus happens. And then that prepped it for God's people to enter Canaan. Do you see how there, there's some alignment there? So. I need to close out. I didn't get into much from this week, but a lot of different things there. And you're going to run across Christians with different perspectives. Let me encourage you in all conversation and dialogue, be gracious and kind. You'll find a lot of people who are very dogmatic and very strong on some opinions and issues. And I, I see more often than not, they drive people away from the Lord. And that is very concerning. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And although we didn't get to a normal Sunday school lesson this morning, Lord, we're thankful for what you've preserved for us, both in Hebrew and in Greek. We're thankful for the men and women who uh, at points have literally fought and died just because they were translating your word into English. Father, we're thankful for those who laid down the sacrifice to give us something we can read in our language. But we're also thankful for the men and women who've continued that work and who dive into language studies and who really um, open up some of these nuggets of Scripture. Lord, as we approach Scripture, we, we do not come with an angle or a perspective that we have the answers. We come with open hearts and open minds, wanting to learn from you. And even as we've discussed here the Genesis 35 passage with Jacob hiding these idols, and there's different things that could mean. Father, we know this much. In our lives, may we follow you completely. May we not harbor idols, but may we be loyal to you. When we study your word, 
Give us eyes and hearts that are open to be molded and shaped by you. We don't need to know all the nuances of a single word, but rather we need to be able to live our lives in such a way that when people see us, it, for them it translates the glory of Christ and they see how that is worked out in a life and they want what we have. And Lord, may we be open with our sharing of the gospel and transparent with who you are and what you've done for us as your children. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.